for everyone who's aware that we will be recording this to let them listen to it. Um, so we'll start now. Um, again, my name's Heather, and I'm with NEMA, and I just want to introduce Sarah Marcou. She's our um, new membership manager. She'll be joining my, the call as my other host here. And so hi, everyone. Say hi. <laughs> And then, um, so we'll start with Adam and just give you a little information about Adam. He works at Historic New England as a collection te technician in the Collections and Conservation Center up in Haverhill. Um, it's actually a really cool site if you guys ever get to go up there. Um, they have a really cool storage system and the bubble is awesome. But I will let Adam take over. So um, if you guys want to finish up doing the survey, it will actually help him with his presentation. Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much, Heather. Um, so, um, as, she, as Heather mentioned, uh, I'm the collections technician here. Um, I work in the um, uh, collection and conservation facility here up in Haverhill. Uh, you guys may, many of you are uh, familiar with Historic New England. We have uh, 36 properties uh, spanning from the north. Northern historic houses that have uh, part of my task is to oversee the IPM integrated pest management uh, for those properties and work with the site managers uh, and guides uh, to inform them on what to look for and and how to sort of deal with um, with issues that may come up.
uh, mix control. And so also be attractive to other pets. So that's an important point because if you're seeing a lot of if you're seeing a lot of mold, this also may be a climate uh, for for insects. Um, common museum pests are protein feeders. Um, and here we have fur, feathers, hide products, wool, silk, bone, uh, carpet beetles, and this is one that I'm, uh, I'm fairly knowledgeable about, fur beetles, hide and leather beetles, cabinet beetles, odd beetles, case-making clothes moths, and wedding clothes moths. Uh, those are all, and they're looking for those animal product, almost those protein uh, type materials. Uh, general feeders, uh, the mold, starch, cellulose, grain, the drugstore beetle, cigarette beetle, book lice, silverfish, fire brats, and cockroaches. And finally, we have the uh, wood feeders, furniture beetles, powder post beetles, death watch beetles, carpenter ants, and termites. So, the, so here we have this fairly self-explanatory. Uh, they can they can survive off of very little food under extremely uh, uh, hostile environments and still survive quite well. They can be very active, wander, forage, hide. Uh, they love excessive clutter uh, for harborage, and they're extremely adaptive and resourceful. And here's our sort of. Uh, top 12 most wanted. Um, and it's good to get, take a good look at these images. If you're currently dealing with an infestation and you're seeing something familiar, uh, it might be worth taking note of. Uh, so here we have uh, webbing clothes moths. Um, and they tend to be very uh, sort of pale, uh, tannish light color. Um, they're not like the case-making clothes moths, they're not very good flyers, and uh, they're almost they're easy to catch almost with your hand if you see one flittering around. Um, they uh, they have a kind of webbing that appears when they're uh, when the larvae are consuming the the product, whether that be um, often wool, silk, uh, and they often um, both clothes moths, webbing and case-making, uh, really thrive in areas um, uh, like feather pillows. Uh, they love feathers. And um, we can get into this more, but um, inside of a feather pillow, they're almost indetectable, and they can live inside there uh, and, and be quite happy. And not, it's hard to see that on the surface of the pillow, what's going on on the inside. And so that's one of their biggest um, areas that I've encountered, uh, feather mattresses and pillows and the like. Case-making clothes moth, um, they have more spotted wings, and um, they, as they... Uh, as they consume, as the larva consumes the, the material, their waste, their frass, retains the same color as the material itself. So they can be very hard to detect as well uh, as they go along. Um, the varied carpet beetle, also known as the variegated carpet beetle, uh, probably the biggest um, culprit uh, in some of our properties here, very persistent, very tough. Um, one experience I've had with them is that they really can uh, enjoy horsehair. So anything upholstered in horsehair, uh, again, the same problem like with the feather pillows, they can get up into that material and consume readily, and it's very hard to spot them uh, inside of that uh, upholstery. Uh, they can thrive, and, and the black carpet beetle, much the same. Um, hide beetle and larder beetles. Uh, I don't have much personal experience with, and if anybody out there does, I, I welcome, um, uh, welcome some input. Same with warehouse and cabinet beetles, cigarette drugstore beetles. Silverfish, I've had a, a bit more. Um, they can be found in really moist, dark areas. Uh, they're starch uh, eaters, and so uh, they can consume, uh, get into paper products. Uh, I think much the same sort of climate with uh, the book louse. Uh, the powder post beetle is another that I have uh, more direct um, experience with, uh, particularly in furniture and also in the house structures themselves up in the beams. Um, and we kind of work uh, 
sort of hand in glove with our property care team uh, who um, if it's a uh, sometimes you'll have uh, the structure of the house is being eaten and a collection item inside is being eaten by the same infestation. The structure of the house uh, is typically treated by our property care team and they will uh, implement uh, a BoraCare treatment uh, that we can uh, talk about more. And then I will typically remove um, any wooden uh, uh, collection objects uh, for CO2 treatment and I can certainly talk about that more. Cockroaches, I think uh, many people know about them and what they like and how they like to live. Uh, they can eat a lot, just about anything. I have personally not encountered them as uh, a serious uh, museum collection threat. Uh, and finally, the, um, the house mouse uh, can wreak all kinds of devastation. I don't think I need to explain that too much in depth. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on here. Um, here's some, uh, so this is sort of the top most likely encounters. Um, uh, the powder post and the furniture beetle. Uh, the powder post beetle will, uh, so there's a nice illustration of how the, um, how the holes look in the wood, the kind of, uh, the kind of um, damage that's provided that's caused by this beetle opposed to the next door and the furniture beetle. Um, powder post beetle um, can leave a, 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 a powdery substance below where they're boring, and that's one way of spotting them. Uh, we refer to it as frass, and that's basically their excrement. Um, one thing I've learned to look out for is that you can have, um, just because you see frass under a, uh, an object, if it's been there for a very long time, and we have some areas that, you know, where collections haven't been touched in long stretches of time, that uh, fresh frass, and this will be like an accumulation of powder below the, um, the infested object, um, fresh frass is what you want to look for, and that sort of would imply an active infestation. And that tends to be white, uh, paler in color. And darker frass might imply that uh, the infestation is, uh, was long ago. It may be complete. Um, or it also might be um, some, uh, from an infestation that happened you know, many years ago, and the object has been moved, and the frass has fallen out much later. So um, it's, it's a little stickier. Uh, as to determining if you've got an active infestation. I think a lot of people see the holes and automatically think, well, those are new holes. Uh, but they could be 100 years old or more. Uh, and so um, it's a little trickier understanding what, a, what an active uh, infestation is with wood boring uh, materials. <clears throat> uh, furniture beetle I have less experience with. Um, I've also heard that uh, it's possible to use a stethoscope on wooden artifacts uh, and that you can detect activity. Uh, you can hear them kind of munching on the wood on the inside. It's not something I've tried yet, uh, but would love to hear about it if someone else has. Uh, okay, moving along here. Uh, next we have, so here we have the furniture carpet beetle and the varied uh, carpet beetle. And really, um, so as you, if you look at these adult Specimens, they're almost identical. I, I would be, and if you see the actual, the actual size, they're extremely small. I would be hard pressed to be able to tell one from the other. The key to knowing the difference between these two is, uh, are the, is the life cycle that causes the most damage, and that's the larval cycle, and that's these little fuzzy guys right here. And they're the ones that are really uh, eating up the material. Um, so far, I have not encountered the black larva indicating a furniture carpet beetle. Uh, but I have seen this, and this is something that, uh, that, that we are working hard to contain. Uh, and um, it's something that uh, I would say this guy is probably on my, on my top three hit list. Um, and, this, and then down below here, you can see uh, the kind of damage that can be done. If you look closely at this middle image down below, there's your horsehair upholstery. And you can, you can see that, you know, if the, if it's, if the um, object is self-contained, if the upholstery is self-contained, they only need a small area somewhere to get up inside, and then they can live happily for generations on this horsehair on the interior. So it's really something to look out for. They also like um, the leather, uh, and they like the fur on these uh, leather-bound uh, um, trunks. Okay, move along here. And, and I would say number 
Um, oh, yes, go ahead. Just a reminder, if anybody does have any questions, to so go ahead and type them in. Um, okay. You know, Adam would be more than happy to answer them. Okay, sorry, Adam, go for it. Okay, no, thank you, yeah. And I'm, I should be paying attention to the chat, too. Heather, if you see something pop up in the chat while I'm talking, feel free to interrupt me. Yep, so far we're so we're good, but I just want to remind everybody that go ahead and ask questions. That's why Adam's yep. here. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to say our number two, maybe number one by the end of the summer, we'll see, uh, is the, um, for us, the webbing clothes moth. Uh, they can really wreak havoc. Uh, I discussed them earlier. Um, feathers um, are prime, uh, silks, wools, that sort of thing. Um, and I already described a bit about, um, about how they conceal themselves. Uh, and these are the adults, and certainly if you're seeing multiple adults flying around, you can make the assumption that there are scores more of larva uh, under the surface um, in, your, in your space and among your collection. Uh, so that's one of the first big signs is if you start seeing these adults flying around, that means they have a thriving environment for the larva. Um, okay. And then here's the common cluster fly. Um, and uh, I, I don't know them to be destructive uh, necessarily, but there's one rather uh, unfortunate problem that they can cause uh, is that they actually are also a source of protein. Uh, so rather than be the fully destructive creature that is literally eating away at your objects, they can also provide a, a supplemental food source when they die um, to the carpet beetle larva. Um, like I say, it's, it's any kind of protein that these dermestids um, like. And um, if you've got uh, other insects in your space, it's certainly not helpful. Um, and they can, they can get by on just about anything. Uh, okay. So here we go. How do I know if I have an infestation? Um, it's most likely if you have live larval activity, which I talked about, and the cast skins or the molts, that's a good telltale sign. Uh, something I've seen more of is with the uh, dermestids or the beetles, the carpet beetles. Um, they will cast those off, and they, you can see little piles of them uh, sometimes underneath the, uh, the infested object. Um, and then you sort of noticeable signs of recent damage. You know, those of you in, uh, in the trenches out in the art storage and, and you've seen, you've looked at something and then come back a month later and you see some, some definite changes going on, that's a real important red flag to investigate further. Uh, reoccurring piles of frass, which we talked about, following a vacuum cleanup. So that, that talks about the old frass versus the new frass. It's a way to confirm that. Uh, if you see that frass, don't panic right away. It could be something long gone, uh, but it's important to vacuum that up and then revisit again and see if you see it reoccurring. Uh, that's a real strong indicator of an active infestation. Um, uh, it, so possibly if you see piles of evidence like frass or excrement, it might mean something. That's why you want to try the vacuuming and revisiting. Uh, tunneling or exit holes in collections, wood, bone, ivory, tears, chewing holes or other signs of damage. And again, this, you know, it might be new, it might be old, and so it's important to, to closely monitor that, uh, that material. Uh, the ways to monitor activity, again, vacuum, uh, checking regular for new frass, blunder traps, uh, sticky traps, um, which we can talk about more, something that I use frequently, uh, domestic monitors, which are simply um, essentially um, uh, protein-baited uh, traps. Uh, designed to attract the larva and monitor the, the larva uh, movement. Uh, paper test strips for wood infesting infested species. Uh, that's something if anyone has a lot of experience with, I'd love to hear more about, but my understanding is you're covering the wood uh, with paper uh, and then revisiting to see if you're seeing new penetrations through that paper. And then here's what I mentioned before about the stethoscope, something that's kind of fascinating to me. I'd love to uh, look into that more. Adam, uh, okay, and so here's Adam. some more. Oh, yes, go ahead. To interrupt you. Do you know where to get the paper test strips? Uh, you know, um, I actually don't know. My understanding, uh, I'm sure that there is a, uh, a special professional product 
but um, I think any so they're wood boring and they can um, uh, they can eat through anything. So I think the the key is to uh, to tightly cover uh, an area that you think might be infested with. I think just about any type of paper. I could be wrong on that, but I think you could use uh, some archival um, uh, tissue uh, perhaps and just wrap, wrap that around the area. And basically, you're just looking for that penetration, so the immediate sign that you've got an active uh, infestation. That one good um, one good resource is uh, Insects Limited. Um, that's one that I go to for pheromone and traps. They seem to have every kind of uh, uh, trap and pest monitoring product out there. So I would start with uh, with Insects Limited. Okay, we just had that question come up, so I just wanted to ask. Oh yeah, no, thank you. About it. Yeah, I saw uh, that. Just hold on one second. David is. Oh, thank you. That's what they would say. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so here's some more, uh, some, <laughs> as I warned, kind of graphic and un, uh, unpleasant, uh, but it's important to know what this, what it looks like. And this is one that's really obviously pretty far gone. Um, and I, you know, I don't think any anybody would uh, have a question as that there's some trouble going on in this image. Um, and these are uh, uh, carpet beetles, again. Um, speaking of products, uh, here's some trapping and monitoring products that we use. Um, the blunder traps or the sticky traps are these top three here. Um, I tend to use the ones on the far right and in the middle, the middle are the sort of ones that you hang uh, for a moth. And uh, down low, it's, uh, you, know, you put them underneath your furniture and things like that. Uh, and then we, uh, we, excuse me, we bait them with uh, with pheromone lures, uh, and all of these products I purchased through Insect Limited, um, and uh, they can be kind of costly. They run about six to eight dollars a piece per lure, so a packet like this is sixty to eighty dollars. Um, but we do um, extensive monitoring. I mentioned that I monitor our, our house museums, but I also do all the IPM monitoring of our collections facility here, where we have. Uh, 80,000 objects um, ranging from paintings to a lot of furniture. Uh, and those are some areas that we have to watch closely. Um, and we also have all of our overflow from our library and archives. So that all has to be monitored quite closely. So I have an aggressive um, uh, trapping uh, monitoring uh, uh, system that I can talk about more after this PowerPoint. Uh, this is the Dermested monitor I mentioned before. Uh, they have, they're baited with protein. And uh, you put them in an area that you think is infested, and then you have to, you can't just leave them there because it is actually really protein, and the animal could survive on it. Uh, so the, the key is to put it there and then revisit it frequently uh, to get an, an immediate idea of, you know, do you have a hot zone? Do you have something going on in that area with dermestids? And that's basically, these are the carpet beetles. Um, and then finally here on the right, uh, is the so the UV uh, light and in the back here and this is something that we have and I'm, I have not yet used but am uh, eager to try it um, is a sort of sticky paper and so uh, the, the the way this works my understanding is um, you obviously have to have some really strong protective eyewear uh, because the UV light is very strong to be damaging to your eyes. Um, and then uh, you go into the area of art storage uh, or in, in the museum house or wherever that you, that you are find suspects, you think there's an infestation, you turn off all the lights and you shine this UV light in the room. And what that will do is uh, attract, um, I think moths are the, are the best culprit that are used with this product. If anyone has any uh, further knowledge, I'd love to hear it. Uh, but then what will happen is you'll start seeing the moths coming to the light, and then they get stuck in the, in the sticky paper behind. Now, it's not really a tool for eradication so much as it will give you a clue as to where they're coming from. So if I'm walking through art storage and I start seeing, oh, here's a whole bunch coming from this you know, northwest corner, it's a clue uh, that, that maybe the materials in that area of the space need to be looked into. And so that's just a way of, it's a, it's a monitoring uh, uh, device. Um, so here we are. Historic New England is green with treatments. Uh, we're researching and using uh, safer, less toxic treatment methods, especially on site. 
uh, preference desiccants and growth regulators rather than pesticides that eradicate. Uh, these are um, chemicals, uh, but they're less, um, less hazardous. I haven't used many desiccants or growth regulators, but I am uh, researching them some. Uh, and then we have the CO2 bubble in Haverhill to treat larger objects. So again, we're addressing our in-house staff here. I'm happy to talk about the CO2 bubble. I'll do that actually after this presentation uh, because we do offer this to outside clients as well. We can talk about that. Uh, and then freezing. And this is a, um, a, a less expensive way of remediating infested objects. It's only um, really good for certain kinds of collections. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty good for textiles. Um, and they're, it's, it's relatively uh, safe and cheap. Um, and we can talk about that more. I think for smaller institutions that have a large uh, textile collections, and if you've experienced a lot of uh, moth infestations, for instance, um, it might be worth uh, investing in something like this, a, a, a sort of a meat freezer, a simple um, commercial meat freezer. Okay, so next. Okay, here's uh, carbon dioxide treatment. Now, I will say that this is actually, these are older photos of our, of our previous system. I'm happy to report that um, uh, over the winter, we, um, over the past year and a half, we received a grant for and have implemented um, a brand new system. Basically, uh, the nature of, of uh, carbon dioxide treatment, um, well, I guess maybe I'll just go right into this part of it right now. What do you think, Heather? Should I just talk about CO2 if people are interested? Um, go for it. I, I think it's kind of cool because I was actually able okay. to do it when I did Yeah, I might as well do it here while, we, while the pictures are up. Uh, and I can flesh it up more if people want to know more. Um, <clears throat> so again, these are older pictures, but um, essentially it's a PVC uh, membrane that's sort of like a tent-like structure that has a, um, an internal sort of framework. Um, uh, and uh, basically, this works well for us because we have a regular amount of material, you know, with the 36 properties plus outside clients, and we work with institutions and private collectors. That we can, this is um, a, about 11, um, about, excuse me, 1,100 or 1,000 cubic feet, uh, uh, about 11 feet wide uh, by 11 feet deep and about 8 feet high. And the key to this membrane is that it's, um, because of this inside framework, you can put very delicate things in there, uh, furniture and so forth, and the membrane won't lay directly on it. Uh, and so the way this works is that we've got a vacuum power unit. We seal it up like a Ziploc bag right around the bottom. Our design is a bit different now. Now we have a door around the front. Um, are you seeing my cursor here too while I'm talking or not? Heather? I can see it, but I'm also one of the vendors. Okay. Uh, but I'm pretty sure other people can see it. <laughs> okay, yes, well, people just are describe. In. Yes, they can. You, you like to talk with your mouth. <laughs> okay. <fine>. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, and so um, our new design has a, new, has a doorway here, so we don't have to unseal the whole thing all around. Uh, we have a power unit. We suck um, all of the, well, as much of the air as we can, pulling it tight on itself. Um, and then we introduce uh, the CO2. Now, the CO2 is a fairly inert gas, and it's collected as an um, industrial waste product. So um, although it's not the greenest thing to be expelling into the atmosphere, it's a waste product that would be expelled into the atmosphere regardless. And so um, it's nice that we can use it one more time uh, before releasing it. And of course, we're always, and with our new system, we're uh, increasing our ability to use less of it. Um, and it's a, it's a gas not to be confused with um, carbon monoxide. Uh, it's not something you want to fill your room with and take a nap in, uh, but it's, it's not uh, super uh, hazardous. In the state of Massachusetts, it's not required to be licensed to handle it, uh, it but that's a state-by-state -state, um, um, uh, process. Uh, different states have different qual uh, uh, qualifications for that. Uh, so, but it's also a very um, dry gas as it comes out of these cylinders. So one of the things that we do, um, well, first in the process, what we do is we bring the temperature in the room up to right around 80 degrees. Uh, this can be kind of challenging in the wintertime. In the summer, it works great. Uh, and we humidify uh, the room 
uh, up to um, uh, as high as 55 to 60 RH. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, first with the temperature, uh, we want to make sure that if we have infested materials that the insects don't go dormant. If it's too cool in the room, uh, they'll go to sleep and they might actually survive the treatment, believe it or not. Uh, so getting that temperature up uh, increases our chance for efficacy. Um, and then also uh, the, uh, the, the relative humidity. So um, as, as I mentioned before, this CO2, once we start introducing it into the membrane, um, comes in very dry. And so we want to maximize our RH safely uh, inside before we get started. And then uh, we humidify the gas through these uh, bubblers, these tanks sitting right in front of the membrane. Um, uh, and and it, they basically the gas uh, is heated, so it, it, it's also very cold as it comes out through a regulator. Uh, it goes through a hose, in through these tanks, uh, which is just with uh, simple tap water, humidifying the gas and introducing it into the membrane. Now that still will drop the relative humidity inside the, uh, the controlled atmosphere, but it won't do it dramatically uh, and jeopardize delicate materials inside. So this is really, my understanding is a museum standard for CO2 treatment. And then uh, essentially what we do is we fill it with CO2 and we get up to a certain concentration not, and then we vacuum out some or another method is we run a hose out of the top uh, that goes directly to the outside and as we fill it in it pushes uh, the CO2 gas is very dense and it hangs out uh, towards the bottom of the membrane and um, as we introduce the CO2, um, it pushes the, uh, the more oxygen concentrated air, which we want to get rid of, out through the top and then uh, that concentration uh, rises from the bottom up. Uh, we now have um, software and laptop computers where we can monitor in real time exactly what the RH, the temperature, and the CO2 concentration is. And we can print out a full graph of the entire period of treatment. Uh, the period of treatment, uh, after reaching a 60 to 80 percent CO2 concentration, uh, we, we hold that for two weeks. Um, and we give about one week to reach that concentration, though. It, uh, we're increasing our efficiency, and that's, that's coming in uh, faster. Um, and we hold that for two weeks, and then we evacuate the CO2. And the material is perfectly safe to handle uh, and, um, and touch to humans, and there's uh, no toxins left with the object after treatment. And in the three years I've been doing it, we've had um, uh, excellent uh, efficacy. Um, I've never had to repeat the treatment, although I know it's not impossible that that, that might be necessary uh, for heavily infested materials. Uh, that's about it for the CO2 bubble. I'm going to press on through um, the PowerPoint here and then we can talk about some more. Uh, I guess first I don't know if there are any immediate questions that folks might have about the CO2 bubble. Um, it doesn't look like it, but if anybody okay. does have questions, we can always come back to it too. Yes, I can always scroll back. All right. So, uh, so here we go. So what if I find an object that is infested. Uh, this is sort of our, in, this is the historic New England infrastructure. So, you know, if you're a guide, you notify the site manager, actions team, and the collections technician, and that's, and that's me. Um, it is, if, you, if you're not too squeamish, squeamish, it's a great idea to save a specimen in a small plastic bag, uh, label with it if it's uh, still living, um, uh, uh, place a plastic bag in a hard plastic or glass container, uh, and then you want to isolate and quarantine that infested object. And that's really, you know, um, you know, I think one of the toughest things is first, you know, you need to uh, get your staff and you, uh, we, you need to be personally looking for trouble because a lot of these uh, insects can really be hidden uh, on the surface of an object. And if you start seeing them right out in plain day on the surface of this infested object, it, the, the infestation is really far along. And so one of the key things is to have folks, even though you walk into a room and just stand there and look around, you don't see anything. And you might not see any moths flittering around. Again, this is, that would be the sign of a very 
far along infestation. So uh, it's important to get staff, uh, people on the front lines in, in collections to go looking for it, to, you know, to turn up that, uh, that bed pillow or pull back that, uh, that coverlet, uh, look underneath, get up underneath um, you know, upholstered uh, chairs and couches and, and see if you see those casings or the frass or those telltale signs. Um, so getting the, getting the spirit behind the, the hunt in these things is really a key part of it. Um, and then getting after it, you know, aggressively uh, by collecting those specimens, mm -hmm. isolating the object. Um, uh, again, it says consult your site manager. Obviously, you want to make sure that you're consulting all the relevant staff people around collections before you start handling things too much. Uh, but, uh, and then you want to look around the adjacent objects and areas for spreading. So if you see one thing that's going on, there's a decent chance that things right in the immediate area could also be infested. It's not necessarily all just contained to that one uh, wing back chair or whatever. Um, uh, check in the floors, cracks, corners, inside and underneath objects, rugs, and pillows. Uh, taking pictures is a terrific idea. Uh, so you can document and you, know, you can make awesome PowerPoint presentations out of them later. Um, fill out, an infest we have infestation report forms. I think that's a good policy for any institution. Um, and then continue to monitor that area for recurring infestations. And this might be a time like, you know, if you had an infestation of, of dromestids of, of carpet beetles and you were able to identify, yes, that's a varied carpet beetle, and we've, you've isolated that object and you got it out of the location, that might be a good time to put down a sticky trap with a varied carpet beetle pheromone uh, in there. And then so that even though you think you've isolated it, you've got that collection item out of there, you're leaving something behind to come back and visit and see if, okay, now there, you would see some adults in there and you know that the activity is continuing. Or if it's free and clear, it helps you rest at ease a little more that you're doing the right thing. Um, next we have, so how do I isolate One second. Yes, um, go ahead. You, would you be willing to share um, the examples that you used at Historic New England for this? Uh, yes, I, I, would be able, I would be willing to do that. Um, so uh, I think folks are, uh, you're welcome to um, contact me via email and I'd be happy to send you a template of, uh, it's, a pretty, it's, a, uh, it's pretty much just a Word document and it's something that you can have on site. It's good to have those as kind of a quick grab uh, wherever um, you know local staff is, um, if it's mostly your a self-contained institution, then you just keep it in um, you know uh, in electronic form and have it on a shared um, shared drive or something like that. Uh, but I'd be happy. It's just a simple Word document. I'm happy to um, to uh, send by attachment if, uh, if folks. You're welcome to um, uh, to share my email address. Okay. That's yep. It? Or they um, they can either contact you, or if you want to send it to me here in the office. Um, okay. I know people might want your PowerPoint presentation too. So. Oh sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. I know they always like those things. Sure. Um, okay. Heather, will you remind me, and I'll make sure to um, to send that along to you as well. Yep. We will do that. Okay. Great. Okay. Okay. And to the PowerPoint, great. I'm glad you guys are uh, finding this useful. Uh, again, this can all get much more. We have more involved PowerPoints too that uh, can take much more time. Um, okay, so uh, pressing on here, how do I isolate and quarantine an object? Uh, so, um, so we want to wrap in polyethylene sheeting, and this is your typical plastic sheeting that you can get at Home Depot. Uh, it's important uh, to get six mil, um, and that is, that is the, the thickness of plastic that no critter can chew through. Uh, so when you're isolating something, it, you know, we all know that uh, just because you've identified something and you've been able to isolate it, you may not have a viable way of treating that object right away. I mean, that's the harsh reality. Um, it doesn't mean that you still shouldn't isolate um, and, and protect the rest of your collection. Uh, and so six mil uh, uh, is the best uh, thickness. It's available at Home Depot and any other uh, home goods store. Um, and you want to wrap that uh, tightly. Um, and so the fold, I'll, I'll go to that. So we have a collection of conservation. Uh, so that's a, this is an important point. Um, if the object is already wet, for instance, let's say it's, this is, this is ugly, let's say it's wet and infested, okay, then you really need to think twice about 
about wrapping it and how you isolate it. You might need to get you might need to dry it first in some fashion uh, because you don't want to be wrapping up wet objects, trapping in the moisture and causing damage that way. Um, uh, if it's not wet, uh, wrap snugly, squeeze out the excess air, being careful not to damage the object. Um, uh, seal all the folds and corners with tape to prevent escape and migration of the pests. Uh, when wrapping furniture, uh, reinforce the bottoms of the legs and base. Uh, move objects to a quarantine area away from at-risk at-risk collections. And um, we've actually I've actually built a kind of walk-in quarantine space inside of our building because we have um, uh, the CO2 uh, we have the controlled atmospheric chamber facility, uh, and you know we have materials coming in and out all the time. And so um, you know because this can be up to four to six weeks in treatment. Um, not all of my infested material is in the bubble and may have to stand by. Um, and we have time to wrap things sometimes and sometimes we don't. So we actually built a designated six mil completely wrapped and sealed room uh, that if we're coming in from other properties or if we have clients dropping off, we can immediately isolate that thing. And it's also for wrapped objects a second uh, redundancy. Uh, in quarantine, and that's a really key thing: is finding, getting that infested material away from, and isolating it from the rest of your collection. Um, uh, and so here, and then finally, this is a great uh, resource for folks: uh, www.museumpests.net. And this is basically a forum uh, for all people in the museum communities. To uh, talk about uh, prevention, monitoring, identification, uh, treatment, and all kinds of links to other good resources, um, and a, a chat forum, and there's a, um, a regular uh, group email uh, where people can put questions to each other um, and send things out to the group. Uh, it's a great way. I, I love it. Um, people are always sending in pictures of of new pests and things that they found. They're having trouble identifying them. There are entomologists that are a part of this group. There are professional um, uh, um, professionals in eradicating uh, all kinds of pests, uh, and I'm a part of it as well. Um, so uh, it's a great learning uh, chat room there, and then you can, and then there's tremendous resources here. So that's uh, museumpests.net as a really good, um, a really good resource. So that concludes my PowerPoint. Um, does anyone have uh, any any questions? I know it's a quiet group today. <laughs> it's pretty quiet, <laughs> and there's a lot going you did, on. You did cover quite a bit, though. Kind of gave me yeah. some trolleys a little bit there, but <laughs> um, we do have a, uh, someone writing. Um, oh, can you talk about freezing? Okay, yeah. sure. I can talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, so don't quote me on this. This is something also um, museumpest.net you can look into to get more details. But I'll, I'll give you my understanding of it. Uh, I think you need a, a freezer that can reach uh, uh, well below 20 uh, degrees and uh, Fahrenheit. And the general pattern of treatment is to freeze, thaw, and freeze again. Um, and uh, um, basically, uh, you're going to freeze for 48 hours, thaw again for 24 to 48 hours, and then freeze again. And that and that process, that rhythm is designed to uh, because when insects get cold the first time, they might go dormant, and then you warm them up again, and then you fool them again, and, you, and they that it increases your option, your chances for efficacy. In freezing, um, it's not something that I've done much of, uh, but I've worked with colleagues who do, um, and it's something that I think is very viable for people with large textile collections. Uh, again, I would refer you to museumpest.net for more detail. Um, okay, so I've got some of the questions here. I'm going to okay, scroll okay. back. And then, um, do, with the CO2 bubble, does it also kill the eggs? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, the CO2 um, treatment uh, is effective for all. Life, all forms of life, and that's that's a very good question, and it's important because the eggs are some of the toughest to deal with, and so the, the answer is yes. 
And that usually just happens within one treatment, correct? Yeah, I haven't had, I mean, I, it's always, you know, you have to sign the dotted line, understanding that it is at least possible that more than one treatment is necessary. Uh, but we've been using, uh, we've been going, averaging about uh, one treatment per month. Uh, and I've been here three years in September, and I've had no need to, and we've had heavily infested materials. I've seen no need to retreat anything so far. Okay. And then a um, couple more questions, and then we'll go back yeah. to the bat problem. Um, for the yeah, sure. CO2 chamber, how much does it cost in, you know, setting it up and if there's grants, um, stuff like that? And then you oh. also might want to talk about if someone does have an infestation of um, being able to bring it to your um, facility and stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the cost of the chamber, you mean the, the cost of, of building your own? Uh, that's what I'm guessing is the question here. Is that correct? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Setting up your own CO2 chamber. Yep. Um, that's something, uh, it was, I can speak with fresh memory on it because, as I mentioned, we just upgraded everything. Uh, we replaced a lot of stuff, but we also had some existing stuff. Um, in general, uh, the cost, you know, it has a lot to do with the size of the facility. You can make, um, and I can also talk more about this, but we also purchased a smaller bubble. We call it the baby. We call these bubbles. It's our short name for the, for the chamber, a little friendlier and, and freaks people out less. Uh, but uh, we also have a smaller bubble, which is essentially just a soft membrane with no inner interior structure. It uh, sits about... Um, five feet by seven feet deep and about five feet high. And this is a really efficient way to work um, in that, uh, first of all, the collections that you're treating uh, need to be self-contained. So essentially they need to be boxed. So you wouldn't just put a chair in there unprotected. Because what happens is when you put it into this smaller bubble and you vacuum out all the air, there's no interior framework. So the membrane sucks in tight against whatever's inside. And then what you're doing is you're minimizing the volume of atmosphere that needs to be adjusted. Uh, if you can imagine just like a, a giant wrinkled up raisin when you've sucked all of this air and you might have um, a, a, a series of textile boxes inside, for instance, and it just sucks tight around that and it's all wrinkled up. And then all you have to do is replace that little bit of atmosphere just inside the boxes. And so you can reach... Um, you can reach an optimal concentration in, a, in an hour or two, as opposed to three to four days. Uh, and that's something that we're, we've just now started using for small batches uh, and for clients. Uh, you have more flexibility in time. You have the scheduling and the coordinating of it is faster, and the treatment is a little bit faster. Um, so if you are just starting out uh, with a, looking into buying a new, um, uh, buying a CO2 treatment facility, I might look into doing something like that. If you have like a lot of things, materials that can easily be self-protected, uh, if that makes sense. So, um, so we did, we got the new membrane, the new bubble, large bubble, uh, the new interior framework, a second bubble. We upgraded into uh, all the, uh, all the uh, monitoring equipment um, and all of that uh, came to over fifty thousand dollars. If you were, to, and that is not including a lot of really important safety um, equipment that we have in the room. We have a, a, an out, a CO2 monitor that monitors the uh, CO2 in the in the greater room outside the bubble. So if there's any kind of leak or if there's any kind of um, excess uh, gas coming from the cylinder and not making it into the membrane, that level is immediately monitored. This is for human safety. And then it's uh, tied to um, a ventilation system. So if it reaches a certain level in the room that might be hazardous, it immediately trips the ventilation system and the air is expunged inside of 20 seconds. Uh, really important safety measures. So th those things are costly as well. Um, so starting brand new uh, uh, and, you know, fitting out a room with all the facilities would probably range between fifty dollars and $100,000. Uh, and it is a long process. There's only one distributor uh, of, these, uh, of these systems, and they're based out of Canada. Uh, the company is Mayhew, and Mayhew, M-A-H-E-U. Uh, and there's only one um, manufacturer uh, based out of the UK, and that's Power Plastics. And you can only purchase uh, a PVC membrane uh, from Power Plastics through Mayhew and Mayhew. Uh, and they have, a, it's a very large business. And so 
these these very specialized facilities can um, can take a long time to get through and to get the order just right. Um, but again, if you have a, a regular need for this kind of thing, and you also need to have a committed um, staff member. Uh, it's important to have someone on hand who, you know, just getting these things going, it takes a lot of trial and error, understanding how the ventilation, how the bubble works and what it means to get that concentration up uh, to the level that you need. Um, so all of those factors play in. It can be, you know, costly. Uh, we have found that in the long run, um, also particularly because we provide this service to outside clients, which I'll talk about, uh, we've been able to cover our costs um, quite well. Uh, so then for those who are interested from outside clients um, who would like to come and use this facility, I would first refer you to uh, the Historic New England website. And um, you can look under uh, con the conservation uh, drop list, I believe. And under there, uh, <clears throat> there's a selection for CO2 fumigation. And uh, that will open up and you'll see a, a picture of of our new bubble facility and you get a sense of the size. I'm standing in front of it. You can see furniture and things on the inside. Basically the same size. It is actually the same size as the old one that you've seen. Uh, and then there it talks of, of, gives you an overview about the process and then the price points uh, thereon. And so we, it's all, the, the cost of, of renting that is all based on the amount of volume uh, that you need to take up inside the large bubble or the small bubble. And so that's uh, so there's a, a little bit of calculating that goes on uh, from there. So I think I hope that answers that. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to look over these questions. Uh, we'll get to the bat. For the bat problem. Yeah, okay. So bats, I don't have a lot of, uh, I'm afraid, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with. We have, um, so um, the way our, uh, organization is set up is that we have the collections team and we have the property care team. Property care guys are the ones who are dealing with the buildings. And they're the ones who are really on the front line of dealing with vertebrates. So any kind of pest control dealing with vertebrates, and they, trust me, they deal with mice, squirrels. We've had raccoons get into the house over the wintertime and just wreak absolute horrific scenarios. Um, and they are the ones who are on the front lines about with the vertebrates. I am strictly invertebrate, uh, but I know that a lot of the work they do has to do with buttoning up their building and finding how they're getting in. And they, uh, they, they use fairly standard uh, trapping systems that any of us would use in our house. Um, bats, uh, I think, it, again, it has to do with work, that property care team really looking at uh, entry points. And I think that would be the primary means of them addressing that. But I can't speak in depth on that subject, I'm afraid. Okay. How are we doing? Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Adam, do you mind putting your email address in um, so people can? Sure. How shall I do that? Just put it into the chat? Yeah, just put it into the chat. Okay. Well, um, we do have a couple people write, um, one person writing a question, so while you're doing that. Okay. Sure, that's right. Okay, so I'll go ahead and send that. Okay, and then do you know any sources for emergency grant funding to deal with infant infestations? I cannot say that word today. Uh, about about emergency grant, grant funding? funding? Yeah. Um, I don't. We had a we had an anonymous uh, donor for this particular grant, um, and it came in early into my uh, my time here. So for me, it wasn't needed. I didn't have to research it. So I'm afraid I have no, I don't have much. I think um, maybe some of the, some of the conservation grants that are out there, there are some, um, I'm just speculating here, but I know that there are some first tier um, uh, conservation grants out there. Uh, is it called the CAP? Um, CAP? Uh, yeah. That's the Heritage Conservation. Yep. Um, I'm I wonder if those, any of that, a grant like that would be related, relatable to um, pest control. Yeah, I know more emergency management stuff. There's emergency grants for that, but I'm not sure about pest control, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm a little, uh, a little lax on the, uh, or, um, lacking on the, uh, on that information. 
again, um, I think museumpest.net would be a great forum to, 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 uh, to ask some questions about that. Okay, and is there any other questions for Adam? I think you covered a lot. Okay. Okay, just one second. We do have Jonathan writing okay. something. Okay, well, thanks to all of you. Uh, it was my pleasure. I hope you guys were able to um, uh, get something out of that. And uh, please feel free to follow up with me uh, via email. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, respond to any questions or forward you on to other folks who might know more than I. Uh, it's an ongoing process, and I think it's uh, you know important for everybody to sort of keep up the keep up the chatter and uh, be in touch. And um, uh, and uh, thanks a bunch, and, and good luck out there. All right, and Adam, thank you so much for giving your time um, to do one of our Lunch with NEMAs. And we will actually be having one next month, um, which is Marilyn Hoffman, and she will be talking about mid-level career, museum careers. So I think if everybody's just basically saying thank you. So thank you, everybody, and thank you again, Adam. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye.